Uh, my name is Sudesh Kala. I'm the Regional Vice President for RWDI. We are a wind and climate engineering company. Um, and uh, today I'll be speaking of, about wind engineering of facades. We've been in this business for 50 years, since 1972. And this year is the 50th anniversary. So we are doing a big splash promoting uh, our company and the work we've done and the lovely clients we've, we've had the privilege of working with. We uh, are wind and climate uh, environmental consultants, and we specialize in all sectors, buildings, industry, and uh, infrastructure as well. And all that we focus on is marrying uh, climate and the built environment, because that's key. If there is no synergy between a built environment and climate, guess what? Climate always wins, right? So it, it becomes more of a costly retrofit later on. And we try to avoid that by providing a state-of-the-art science. So we, our DNA is Canadian. Uh, we are based in Canada, a, a small town, a university town called Guelph uh, uh, near Toronto. Uh, we have multiple offices across uh, North America and we have about 28 offices, I believe, uh, around the world. And uh, I look after Asia Pacific, which is the orange region here. And I have about eight offices in Asia Pacific. I'm based in Singapore, but we have offices in uh, Australia, India, Kuala Lumpur, Hong Kong, and uh, China as well and Malaysia as well. Uh, this slide, whenever I pull up, clients always ask me, uh, why do you always, why do you talk about buildings that are 500 meter tall or 1000 meter tall? And RWD has, has had the privilege of working on some of the most tall, exciting projects in the world, uh, super tall, mega tall towers in the world. This is a, a very important slide because it, it shows how much science has evolved because most of us would have flown past that height, right? Uh, 500 meters, 1,000 meters, 10, uh, 3,000 meters, you would have flown past that height. But how many of us have actually lived at that height, 500 meters or above, to know what the wind environment is? How many of us would have stood outside in the balcony there to experience the wind? Wind speeds increase with height. So what happens is as and when you build facades that are so complicated on towers that are so tall, you basically defy everything. You go back to whatever you studied in your college, in your undergrad, and you start relearning, unlearning and relearning. And that unlearning and relearning makes you learn new concepts, new things, and that's how technology and science evolves. And all the learnings that we've had from these complex super tall projects, we apply on regular 10, 20, 30 story buildings. And that's how we constantly stay ahead of the game. Uh, these are some of the tools that we have. Again, I'm using the word tools because these are just tools. We have about five uh, state-of-the-art wind tunnels. We have water flume. Uh, we have uh, state-of-the-art computer clusters, uh, computational fluid dynamics tools. But again, these are just tools because what's more important is the brains behind those tools because that's what's going to drive success. That's what's going to drive quality as well and accuracy. Because at the end of the day, if we have a computer, you can pretty much do anything these days. But to understand the wind flows, you need to be a wind engineer. To understand uh, building physics, you need to be uh, somebody with building science background, right? And we have masters and PhDs using these tools. So again, just some specification for some of our uh, state-of-the-art wind tunnels. Uh, this is where we actually test buildings. So our largest wind tunnel is 24 feet wide. And that's where we test bridges, super tall towers, built up cities, air quality studies. And our regular wind tunnels are about eight feet, 2.4 meter wide. Uh, we have uh, wind tunnels in Canada and, and in India as well. And we can test uh, more than thousand pressure sensors simultaneously at one go for facade. The question then uh, we often get asked is why do we do a wind tunnel test? Uh, most of the building codes in the world uh, have one size fits all approach, which means uh, they are not specific to the project being tested, to the project that is being built. If you just take a peak window, uh, peak, uh, take a peek outside your window, you'll see buildings that are of all shapes and sizes. So, which means you can't just paint it with a broad brush, right? And uh, most of the building codes just give you two numbers for designing the facade one for designing the central portion which covers almost 75% of the facade. And then one more number just for the corners and edges, which covers about 25% of the facade. But guess what? The code often under predicts uh, the corners and edge pressures because of suctions, they cannot replicate the actual, uh, they cannot calculate the actual suction forces. 
in the edges and corners, so they underpredict it, and they overpredict the central portion. So what happens is the developer pays a lot of money for a perfect uh, facade, and uh, seventy-five percent off. Uh, the facade, if designed using a traditional code approach, is over-designed, but 25% remains under-designed and at risk. So when there is a wind storm, if one window is left open or a door is left open, or, or say, for example, a small pebble is lifted by the storm and it breaks a glass, the pressure inside the building changes. And when the pressure inside changes, the other panels are not designed to take on the additional pressure, they start giving away. And that's why you need to optimize your facade using state-of-the-art wind tunnel testing. And uh, again, uh, wind is, all that wind tries to do is when it sees an obstacle in the form of a building, a bridge, or any structure, museum, or, or an auditorium, or any type of structure, all that wind tries to do is it tries to go around it, right? It tries to take the path of least resistance. And in doing so, it creates havoc. You can see the different issues here, building downwash, winds being accelerated around the corners, winds being squeezed between building gaps, and winds uh, creating vortices between uh, two upwind and downwind, downwind buildings. All these things create high suction zones or high positive pressures, and both are not good for, and both have to be taken into account while designing the facades. So what does wind tunnel testing do? Wind tunnel testing optimizes the facade pressure for your project. So it takes into account site-specific wind climate, exactly where your building is going to be. It takes into account the exact shape of the building, uh, actual surroundings within half a kilometer radius. In fact, a long upwind terrain also that's been modeled up to 30 kilometers. And then we also look into uh, estimating what the actual internal pressures would be. So the final product that you get is the actual pressures your building would face, your facade would face once it's built. And what are the advantages of wind tunnel studies? Again, this is a tried and tested uh, method and uh, most of the codes recommend wind tunnel testing for complex geometries. Why? To optimize your cladding pressure so that uh, there is no over-designing. At the same time, there's no under-designing as well and the risk is completely mitigated and uh, you result in significant cost savings because 75% of your facade, which would have otherwise been over-designed using code, now is adequately designed. And the 25% of your facade, which would have been at risk, now the risk is mitigated. And that's why you do a wind tunnel test. In today's industry, maximum uh, insurance claims still keeps arising from facade uh, damage. Again, if you look at the image here, you see so many glass panels have fallen off, right? Again, it's, it's not just a matter of uh, all panels falling at the same time, it's, it's always a chain reaction. So in the event of a storm, a few panels uh, give away because of dominant openings or breakage, uh, if they have not been adequately designed. But because of the change in internal pressure and the wind gushes inside, it starts knocking out other panels one by one. So it's always a chain reaction. This is what we need to try to avoid, prevent, and that's what we try to do using a wind tunnel test. So I'll quickly go through the wind engineering process, the steps involved in, in, in a wind tunnel testing. This uh, chain uh, that you see there, the link, uh, is, is Alan G. Davenport. He's the father of wind engineering. There are five aspects to wind tunnel testing, and this chain is the most critical, uh, and it covers all aspects of wind engineering. So the first thing is, before we do anything, it is the first thing we need to do is do a detailed wind climate study, all right, for the project site. Uh, so you would have open topography, you would have mountains, winds are going to change. So we need to look at what the design wind speeds are, 50 year wind speeds are. We also need to look at what the wind directionality is. Is it coming from north, northwest or south, southeast? Which direction the design wind speed is coming? So that's the first thing we gather. And then what we do is we have to make sure that we uh, are generating the uh, proper boundary layer wind profile in the wind tunnel. The left image is a cross section of a wind tunnel. So you have the fan here. And then once you turn on the fan, wind blows through and it goes through these uh, conical spires that you see there. And the spires help mix up the air, add turbulence. And then wind goes through this long cross section with these small uh, cubes, uh, foam blocks. They add turbulence and they also help mix the air. And the, the, the idea is the way it's been designed is by the time wind hits, the outer edge of what we call as a half a kilometer radius of the study site, the 
uh, appropriate wind profile is generated in such a way that the wind speed and turbulence at the height of the building is exactly as it would be once the building is built. That's all that we're trying to achieve in a wind tunnel, right? And of course, as I said, half a kilometer radius of all surrounds are typically modeled at the same scale. The scale could be one to 300 or one to 400, depending upon the size of the building. Short buildings, we can even go down. Tall buildings, we can even use a bigger scale. But again, the typical scale is one to 300 to one to 400. So uh, again, it's important that we uh, model the actual building. So we get an architectural drawing, 3D model from the architects. Uh, we create our own 3D model, which is then 3D printed uh, in, in, in uh, studio lithography, advanced 3D printers, right? We construct the physical model and then we instrument it with pressure taps. Instrumentation is very complex. For any average, say, say 30, 40, uh, 50 story buildings, you're talking about uh, 500, 600 pressure taps. So we have to make sure that all hot spots are adequately captured. That's very important. That's where flow separation occurs, right? So the central portions, the flow separation is, uh, the, the, the pressure gradient is not that steep. So uh, the pressure tap distribution would, would be a bit sparse, but as and when you go towards the corners, as you can see here, right? Or at the edges, the, the pressure tap density is very high because that's where flow separates, right? And we need to capture that. Uh, so once that is done, the next step is actually constructing it, 3D printing the model. And we do that part by part and then stitch it together. And the parts already have pressure tubes in built, built inside them, advanced technology. And the next step is connecting these pressure taps with pressure tubes, long pressure tubes. And these pressure tubes are then connected underneath the turntable uh, to a pressure transducer that records uh, the uh, time fluctuations, uh, time varying uh, pressure fluctuations. And again, almost, uh, uh, you, you can even measure thousand plus pressure taps at one go, right? So this is uh, an image of an actual wind tunnel. The fan is behind this. These are the spires that I showed you before. The roughness blocks are here. So once I turn on the fan, wind comes through uh, between tra traverses between the spires over these roughness blocks and hits this proximity model. And that's the study building. And the image on the right shows you the pressure taps. So all that we measure are the external pressures. We do not install taps inside the building because we cannot measure that. We are, we are more interested in, interested in what happens outside the facade, right? So we have 500 or 1,000 pressure taps. But what's most important is we have to make sure that every single pressure tap, the data that we collect, is good quality. That's very important. And uh, let me just go back one second. So as you can see here, you see these uh, wind directions marked here. So we test every 10 degree. So for every 10 degree, we collect uh, wind uh, data and then we rotate by another 10 degrees and we do it 36 times. So we go around the compass. So we have a 360 degree pressure plot around your building. And now for, and imagine there are thousand taps 36 times. So there's 36,000 data points and we have to go through each and every single data point plot like this to make sure the data is of good quality. That's a QA, that's due diligence. Because sometimes what happens is pressure tubes could be pinched or blocked. The signal may not be right. So garbage in, garbage out, right? So we have to make sure that the data quality is good enough to get good quality output. So this is a key step uh, in the analysis. And then, as I said, integrating local climate is key. Because if you were to take Jakarta or Malaysia, which is in the tropics, or anywhere in the world for that matter, their 50 year design wind speed does not come from all wind directions. Like if you look at the plot here, the 50 year wind speed is pretty much coming from Northwest, right? North, Northwest or Northwest, right? But if I were to uh, look at East, right? Uh, or, or Northeast, the strength of the wind is not very high. So the probability of design wind speeds coming from Northwest is very high as opposed to Northeast, right? This needs to be integrated into the wind tunnel results and that's where you get the savings. As shown in this slide, uh, if you would do a non-traditional uh, code-based approach, you don't apply a directionality factor, but in a wind climate analysis, we use the method methodology called a uh, crossing uh, noted here, which is a statistical analysis, most robust, and uh, we, that is used to combine the wind climate data with the wind tunnel data 
right? And in doing so, we typically see a, a reduction in the peak pressures of about 10 to 30 percent. So the final numbers are between 70 percent and 90 percent off uh, the non-directional results. So 10 to 30 percent reduction, which is significant. Again, these are just external pressures, right? So we've not taken this problem away yet. So how do you deal with this problem? So what happens is we have to do an internal pressure analysis. So what we do is we say, okay, fine. Do the buildings have operable windows? Where is the building located? In a typhoon area or in a non-typhoon area? So then we, then we calculate if there were to be a dominant opening, windows left open or doors open or a pebble picked up by a storm and breaking a glass, if that dominant opening were to occur in the corner portion, how much will the internal pressure change by? If that opening were to occur in the central portion of the facade, what will the internal pressure change be like? We calculate those internal pressures, right? During uh, using different equations, uh, different probabilities, so proper probability assessment. And those internal pressures are then augmented, added onto the external pressures to give you the final design pressures, which are these. So what we do is the final design pressures, for those of you who've done a wind tunnel test, we would give them, uh, we'd give you pressure block diagrams of positive peak positive pressures and peak negative pressures superimposed on building elevations, all four and the roof for both positives and negatives. And this is the optimized uh, facade pressure for the structure which takes into account all possible risks. And uh, the last slide I have here is, is taken straight from AAC code, building code. It's a comparison of wind tunnel to code. And as you can see here in the image, the second column has different building shapes. And the first column is building height. And one thing you would notice in this, in, this, in this table here is that the wind tunnel results are significantly below code predicted, uh, code calculated pressures, as I was telling you earlier. So this is straight up from the code. I think that brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, uh, yeah, let me know if there are any questions. Again, thank you for your time. Yes, how about vortex shading? And how about wind speed uh, parameter that's uh, commonly used? Uh, is it the fastest mile or three second gusts? Thanks. Okay, so that's a good question. Uh, it depends on your local code. Some local codes would go for 10 minute mean. Some local codes would say three second gust. Some uh, like New York, for example, would say fastest mile, but there are conversion factors. In fact, you can even Google the conversion factors. It's called DURST, D-U-R-S-T, conversion factor. If you just type this in Google, it'll give you the chart to convert from fastest mile to 10 minute mean to three second gust. Uh, 